Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're welcome to the First Reformed Church. It's Rally Sunday, beginning of the season, so to speak. And we're very glad that you're, you're with us. I want to uh, direct your attention to some announcements. Um, we've got uh, adult choir rehearsals. I think Susan wants to say something about that. Blessed assurance. 
let's uh, we'll do just one of these, verse one.
We'll get some more time to uh, connect with everybody later at the uh, luncheon, but uh, so good to express the joy of fellowship uh, reunited by the Holy Spirit.
anybody in sixth grade class will come with me up to the class today. Uh, so just wait for me in the back there. Uh, seventh and eighth grade class is another new teacher that we have this year, and that will be uh, with Mrs. Uh, Lesberg. So everybody who is in seventh and eighth grade, uh, go up with uh, Mrs. Lesberg. Of course, we will have our uh, high school class this year uh, being taught by Mr. Red Vanley. So anybody who's in the high school class uh, this year and wants to uh, join the high school class, please go forward with, uh, uh, with Mr. Red Vanley. This year's adult Bible school will be taught by Pastor. Um, and once again, you don't want me to do the sermon today. So we're going to let you guys stay here. <laughs> and then I'll go in. Now that the kids are gone, I just wanted to uh, thank all the parents once again for bringing your children and allowing us this opportunity. Because some of you just two or three years ago or four years ago and some of you more than ten years ago held your child up before the cross right here next to the baptismal thing proclaiming that you will be teaching your kids through the word of Christ and uh, growing their faith throughout their entire life. And this is your first step is by teaching, by sending them to school, coming to worship with them, and being in class, uh, being in learning for yourself in class year, year after year after year. And now this is one of the greatest things that we can do is to build them up to confirmation and becoming a member of this great church. So thank you and look forward to working with you all this year. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Let's sing number 433, Rise Up, O Church of God. Jairus came, and when he saw him, 
fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. Then there are some verses about another woman that's healed, and then let's uh, go to 35, Mark 5, 35. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Jairus, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overwhelmed and overcome with the amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. It's the word of the Lord. Like Jairus, we've all been there when a loved one, when a member of our family is sick, we feel that urgency, got to get help. And sometimes, you know, in our case, we call hospital, call doctor, call friends, however way that works. Very important to note for Jairus who he was. It says he was a leader of the synagogue, so in our case, he would have been an elder or a deacon or something like that. Now, you have to understand some of the context here. Jesus was not part of the official system or the establishment. So Jairus, Jairus was taking a huge risk to go see Jesus and ask him for help. And I want you to hear how he came with faith to, to Jesus. He comes and he says, please come. My daughter is at the point of death. I want you to lay hands on her so that she will be made well. He came with faith. But he also came with this sense of risk that his reputation would be harmed and, and damaged, perhaps permanently, because he was going, you know, outside the system. He should have just gone to the synagogue leaders and maybe they came over and prayed. But like the woman in the, uh, the other woman in this uh, Mark chapter 5, somehow people were hearing about Jesus. She heard about him. Jairus heard about Jesus, and he comes to him. <clears throat> And I want you to see in this passage some very important things, even some surprising things, about how to still be awakeable to God and his movement in our lives. One of the most important things about Mark chapter 5 and about this passage is a number. And that number is, anybody? Twelve. Two things. The woman in the earlier part of the passage, we didn't read that, but we've heard this before. She's uh, had a hemorrhage. She's had a condition for 12 years. And then, when Jesus goes to Jairus' daughter, it says she's 12 years old. You may be wondering, what's, what's with all the significance of the number 12 there? Original readers, original leader, original readers and listeners of this passage would automatically have known that the number 12 refers to the 12 tribes, tribes of Israel. Meaning, the representation of 12 in this was speaking to Israel. And so look at what Jesus does with the number 12. The woman who has the hemorrhage for 12 years, she's healed. That's God. She was unclean, so to speak, in their term. The girl who dies... She is 12 years old. What this was saying to original listeners and readers, and what it says to us is, Jesus was the answer to the state of Israel at that time, to the people of Israel. Jesus comes and brings the girl back to life. Jesus heals the sick woman. And 
So the message was that even in at that time, Israel is in this state of oppressed by the Romans, but also in some ways not in right relationship with God. But here comes this man, Jesus, to heal and restore. It's a beautiful thing. So I want you to keep that in mind as you think about, and we think about uh, being awakeable. I also want you to see some interesting things here in the scripture. Jesus, again, Jairus comes to him and says, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him. And then, of course, while Jesus, after Jesus heals the woman with the hemorrhage, they come and say, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher no more? And, of course, that news would have been absolutely crushing to Jairus. But he gets this message. Jesus says to him, do not fear. Only believe. We've talked about how many times, multiple hundreds of times in the Bible where someone from heaven, whether it's a messenger, whether it's Jesus, whether it's God himself, says to someone, do not fear, but believe. And we hear that today. So, so much of what we hear and listen to in the world is frightening and terrifying. So we want to remember, do not fear, but believe. Jesus takes some of his friends and they come to the house. And uh, this, just some context here, the, the people outside weeping and wailing, that was a thing, that was kind of a, uh, that was a thing that you paid for. When someone died, you paid for people to come make a commotion and wail and weep. It was part of their part of their grieving system. From a cynical side, you could see how that could, you know, spin out of control. But anyway, here they are, and Jesus says to them, Why are you, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And uh, they laugh at him. They think, who's this guy? What is this guy doing here? Telling us we should stop wailing and weeping. Somebody's died in this house. Keep that in mind. And Jesus goes in. It's so interesting that they, you know, the, the way we read, the, the way we have the New Testament, it's written in Greek, but it was spoken in Aramaic. And so there, here's this word, talithakum, that's in Aramaic. The rest is in Greek. He took her by the hand and said to her, talithakum, little girl, wake up. Or little girl, get up. And she does. And they are overwhelmed and overcome with amazement. Jesus comes to that place like we talked about last week. So often when we're in a place of grief and darkness, we think we're alone. But so many stories in the gospel and even in the Old Testament, God is present in the darkness. Admittedly, yes, it's hard to see, harder to see. But he's there. He's invited in this case. I want to share with you three very important things that we hear about being awakeable thanks to this passage. The first, of course, is what wakes up the little girl, the girl who's 12 years old who represents Israel. She's asleep. She has died. What wakes her up? Jesus' voice. It reminds me of a story when uh, Jenny and I went to church. We, I think we were early married. And uh, it was hot that day. It was hot. And uh, Jenny at first started to feel a little faint. And so she sat down. And then someone came over. This is kind of a funny church story. Somebody came over and said, oh, is she okay? Would you like some water? And we said, yes. The, the water never showed up. <laughs> the woman never got the water. Anyway, Jenny, then I realized that Jenny's about to faint. So I, I reached back and I grabbed her just before she hits the, hits the pew. And I'm holding her head. And I'm starting to think, now what am I supposed to do with someone who's fainted? And so I just start whispering. I say, Jenny, Jenny. And she, she kind of comes back to it and says, oh, I must be laying in bed because Chris was whispering to me. <laughs> but in fact, she had fainted in church. But uh, it was my whisper that, uh, that brought her back. But in a more real sense, Jesus' Jesus's voice awakens this girl. And you and I need to be awakeable to Jesus' voice. You say, I'm, I hear voices, Pastor Christopher. That's okay. But you do have access to his voice through God's word, through the Bible. 
You can hear his voice every morning. You can even do it electronically on your phone. You can get a Bible verse. You can get a gospel verse. You can make it that specific if you want to hear him speaking to you. His voice is so powerful. We talked about it last week. He spoke into Lazarus' tomb and brought him out. This girl had died. He speaks to her and simply says, little girl, get up. And she comes back to life. So many times in life we feel dead, so to speak, exhausted, frustrated. We just need to hear his voice. It's there. Okay. Second thing that's important here that we need to see is that Jesus has a very different perspective on life and circumstances. Now, the humorous part of it is when Jesus shows up, he says, what's well, all the commotion? She's asleep. They all go, ha, 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 ha. They're laughing. That's because they represent the world view. Now, there's no doubt that she was dead. And there are times where people are going to die. We can't stop that. But it does teach us if we're going to be awakeable in this life, we have to look at things like Jesus does. Not like the world does. The world says, it's over, she's gone. Let's start wailing and moaning. Jesus says, just asleep. And so it occurs to us, how many other situations, other than actual death, okay, how many other situations in our lives do we write someone off or write a situation off? And Jesus is saying, no, we're not done with that. How many times do we say that about relationships? How many times do we say that about institutions, churches, schools, all sorts of situations? And Jesus says, not dead just dormant, just asleep, just pausing. How about in our own lives, where we think, I'm done, I've got nothing left. And yes, I agree, that's, there are going to be times where we feel like that. But remember who is with us. Remember who's in the room with us, who says, no, it's not over. No, you're not finished. You're still, still something to do, still something to live for. It's a beautiful message. And it's so important to see. Jesus sees the world very differently. We've got we've to move towards that. We've got to ask for help to move towards that. And that's part of being awakeable. If we can dare to say something's not over, that's transforming. That's being awakeable. <clears throat> Third and final point. Perhaps related to last week, but also this week, the most awakeable thing about this passage, the most awakeable part of our lives, is the need for God. And this is most, you know, most evident when it comes to Jairus. Jairus is the one who goes and risks, like I said, risks his his reputation and his standing in the synagogue to meet Jesus. Now where did that come from? That came from his need for God's help. Think about Jairus for a second. He's very much like us. He's involved in his local faith community. He's important. He's, uh, he's got responsibility. He believes in God, but he's probably never experienced the living God before. And so what happens is his daughter becomes sick. And like a lot of us, a lot of times, it does take a, a uh, very catastrophic event for us to really experience the depth of love that God has for us. You see, for Jairus, he had gone through all those Sabbaths and all those festivals and all those things, and he had gone through all of them, and yet he didn't really feel the need for God. He had gone through the motions. In many ways, Jairus was asleep. And then his daughter gets sick. And he thinks, just like the rest of us, I've got to do something. I've got to, I've got to help her. And when he came to realize what he awakened to was that, I'm sure he asked his friends at the synagogue for prayer, but he knew he needed God directly. And so he heard about Jesus. And 
And he goes to Jesus. And he asks, would you please come and lay your hands on my daughter so that she may be made well and live? And so he broke through that kind of, when religion is not a good thing, religion is not a good thing when it's just routine and ritual. But here was the Son of God, the living God, walking around with the power to heal and give life and awaken. And that's what Jairus needed. And he broke through his sleep and slumber, so to speak, and went right to God. And so the most awakeable thing about this passage, and I think that really the most awakeable thing we can have in our lives is when we say, I need God. Yes, please come to church on Sunday. Yes, be involved and serve all of those beautiful things. But if you want to be fully awake to God, then you have to start at the place of need. And I tell you, as a 44-year-old involved in church almost all my life, I find that the need for God increases. It's not, I'm not getting tired and I've had enough of this. It's, I need God more every day. That's the awakening that's, that's happening in me. Not maybe just an age thing or a wisdom thing, whatever it is. But I wake up every day thinking, I need God more. Just because I have gifts, just because I have talents and things like that. It doesn't matter. I need God to walk me through every day. Most mornings I wake up and I think of the verse from Psalm 30. It says, into your hands, Jesus said it too. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Why? Because I know, yes, we live in a nice house. And yes, I have a job and Jenny has a job and we have nice kids and all of those things. Those are nice. But I need God more. I need Jesus Christ in my life. That's what's going to save me. That's what has saved me. That's what's going to get me through a day. And so Jairus awakens to, I have this nice religion. I'm involved in my synagogue. But now my daughter's sick, and I need God. And I need him in a way that I've never needed him before. And the beautiful part of the story is, Jesus says, let me go with you. And then the news, the daughter dies. And, and then uh, Jesus comes and awakens her. It's very easy to think in this story that the awakening is the little girl, again, representing Israel, that Jesus was to come to awaken not just Israel, but the rest of the world. But perhaps the more poignant awakening is Jairus, who had gone through his whole life, perhaps sleepwalking a little bit through his faith, but then came to that place of need and said, God, I need you. I need you now. God responded. And Jairus was never the same. We don't hear what happens afterwards. We don't hear that maybe he was kicked out of the synagogue for this. All we hear was there was amazement. And Jesus says, don't tell this to people, which we can talk about that another time, but we don't hear what happens to him and his reputation. It didn't matter. He and his, his life and his family's life was changed. They were awakened to think that there was more than the four walls of the synagogue to their faith. That God himself will come to that place of need that when we cry out, God will respond. And to walk around like that, believing that the power of God, the presence of Jesus Christ is that easily accessible for us and that needed. That's to be awakened. That's to be awakened the love and power and the grace of Jesus Christ in this life. Don't you think we need it? Don't you think we need it? Whether it's in our lives, whether it's in the life of this church, this community, to be awakened to that kind of power and presence and love and healing, we all need it on some level. But this morning we're saying, a, an alarm clock to awaken to that need and that gift. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this series and this passage today reminding us that 
It's easy. It's easy to fall asleep. It's easy to, to be sleepwalking through, through church and through life. But at some point, all of us are going to reach that point like Jairus did. It could be a loss of a job. It could be a health situation. It could be a breakup of a marriage. All of these things. Life breaks us, Lord. And maybe some of us need, you know, some of us get to that place where that's the only thing that wakes us up. But we're asking this morning, we need you whether good things or bad things are happening. We want to be awakened to that need right now. Lord, awaken this church. Awaken these people. Awaken people watching this. To how good you are. How powerful you are. And how much we need that in our daily lives. Push away this drowsiness of money and security and jobs and, and other people and relationships. All these things that we think uh, protect us and secure us. But you are our only hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take some time to give thanks to God, receive the uh, tithes and offerings. Let's pray together. Let's pray about it. Lord, we ask for your help this morning. Just like Chiris, we want to come to you. We have many needs on our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. People, we need you. We want to, we want to carry them to you like those, uh, like the brothers did uh, for the uh, guy who was paralyzed in the gospel and they cut a hole in the roof to get him to you. We're bringing these people to you this morning. Well, we're giving thanks for uh, Helen's life and uh, her battle. And we pray that uh, she is with you at peace now and that she, her family is comforted uh, in their grieving. Well, we're thinking of Amanda, a young woman, in the uh, excitement of life, and yet she has ovarian cancer. With cancer, we pray for healing. We pray for uh, curing for her. Pray for comfort for her fiancé and strength during this time. We continue to pray for Jack, Alberta's son, 
Hopefully he'll get uh, some surgery uh, this week or very soon to remove that growth. In the meantime, we pray for protection over his body. Well, we're thinking of uh, Rich's sister, Lorraine, and she has lost a son. And it was a long journey, and the rest of Rich's family as well. And so they're grieving. We pray for Lorraine, just like you said to the little girl, Talitha Kuhn. We pray that you will say to her, a woman, get up and uh, be comforted. Lord, we lift up uh, Wendy and her shoulder surgery. We pray for recovery there. Think of uh, Camille, who's battling cancer. Give her strength. Other people battling cancer. Carter as well, and Jill. We think of our Sunday school teachers and everyone. We bless uh, Ross and the other people helping downstairs, uh, preparing a nice lunch for us. And Lord, we think of uh, people in the Middle East, Christians who are staying alive by faith and even sacrificing their lives because of your name. We know you know them. We know that you honor them. And we pray for strength. Then we give thanks for Harold and Karen's uh, anniversary this week and uh, the gift of marriage. We thank you for that, Lord. And then we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Close our worship this morning with River 434, Revive Us.
probably not even put her on a leash and walk her into the bag. Yeah, I know. Okay, but then you're ready to leave. Uh, Hello? Have your attention, please. I just want to say a prayer for our officer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. We ask you to bless our discussions and our fellowship. We ask you to bless this food. We give thanks for the hands that made it. And uh, we're just uh, so thankful to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Carla. I'll be right back. What's up, Jack? I'll be right back. Okay.